Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome into uh, the Hopping Kernels for Linux distributions uh, with Neil Gumba, and uh, I will let him take it from here. Hi, people. <laughs> so, <laughs> really? All right. So, we're here to see how kernels get made. So, what am I? Uh, I do a lot of open source stuff. This is more bullets. If you were here for the previous talk, this was more bullets than was on the previous talk because this is the full list. Um, I do lots of stuff in a lot of Linux distributions. I'm also a contributor to software management, systems management, desktop Linux, the whole works. I'm a co-host of a podcast and I'm a consultant for my own company. So let's talk about the Linux kernel. So the Linux kernel is both special and not really special. The Linux kernel is a simple project, if you can believe it. Uh, it's written primarily in C and assembly and has no external runtime uh, dependencies. All subsystems and drivers and everything that you would use with it are included in the tree. And it is substantially well documented. But it's also complicated because they added Rust to the mix of these languages and everything is weird with that. Um, building, there are user space components that are actually tightly integrated with the kernel code that you build as part of the kernel build that you have to ship with it that are also, well, kind of special in their own right. And then all subsystems of the drivers are included in the kernel. Note that's on both sides of this because it's both simple and very complicated to have both of them there. Um, the build tooling is sufficiently complicated to, re to require its own bespoke programs and documentation and maintenance. And that's not necessarily good either, but here we are. So when you're building the kernel for yourself, you have a few reasonable choices. So most of the time, what people do is they seed the build configuration from your running kernel. And so this is make local mod config. So it'll just get the, current, the config from your, from your distribution, which is usually installed in slash boot, and do something with it. Or you can seed it from an existing kernel uh, that you have made before. So if you've done a kernel build and you have a config, then you would run it again after you've updated the tree and it will use the same config again. Or you can build the kernel with all the things, which I really don't recommend, which is make all mod config or all yes config. And then there's a slightly less reasonable choice. And only slightly, maybe. I, I think it's slightly more than slightly, which is doing it interactively and selecting every option by hand. Um, there's thousands of options. You really don't want to do this, but if you are sufficiently motivated, uh, you could. There is a graphical tool included in the source tree, which you do have to build to run it, which is a thing that makes it easier. There's also end curses, and you can also do it through a dumb serial terminal, terminal because again, bespoke build tooling. It's a lot of work though. And it, it, it produces a thing that you don't really know what the heck you're supposed to do with. Um, it's, uh, it's the kernel config file or a k config file or, a dot, or it'll often be shown as a dot config. And why is it a dot? Because apparently it's messy to see the, the output of your own artifacts that are used as inputs and having it show up in your tree. And so we're just gonna make it a hidden file just because. Uh, so there you go. That's, the, uh, that's, a, that's like a subset of it. And of course, if you look at this, Maybe you could probably guess that BT means Bluetooth. Uh, but I don't know what BT Vert.io has anything to do with it because, but it, it, it has something, maybe. These things often tend to be either self-explanatory or completely inscrutable. Mm -hmm. So, and there's never something in the middle. So this is about the simple case though. Like this is if you're just doing it once. Maintaining that kernel over time means you have to do this process over and over and over every time you're dealing with this. So if you're an unfortunate soul, this means you're doing this basically once a week, every week for the rest of your life. Because uh, you have uh, basically every one to two weeks, you have a patch release going out for a stable release. Every six to eight weeks, you have a new stable release coming out. And then every... Uh, uh, I guess every once a year you have a you have one of those stable releases declared as a long-term kernel and then that one has even more point releases and if you're the poor soul who has to track both 
kinds of trees, both stable and long-term, then you're in the unhappy place of having to do this uh, basically, I think, probably on average about as many times as there are days in the year. And so that's probably not going to be fun if you have to do all this work kind of manually and things like this. And because of how the kernel is developed, it does, it's not a 30 second job to just go pull the code and then run the build again. No, the options are not stable, just like everything else inside the kernel is not stable. And so your kernel configs will just break and the, because the funness of the tooling, it doesn't tell you when your option no longer takes effect. It just doesn't take effect anymore because that, uh, that dot config here, that dot config is just a text file that's read to pass as make variables. It's all it is. It's just a list of make variables. And guess what? If a make variable does nothing, then of course it does nothing. And that means including not telling you that it does nothing. So that is sort of, you know, in a nutshell, the biggest complexity around dealing with this stuff. And so, and, and again, and this is just the build time stuff. So why do you want to use this kernel that you built? Well, it turns out that's not defined behavior either. So you can, of course, make your kernel image, but where do you put it? How do you register it? How do you configure your bootloader to use it? That's different for everybody. And so depending on how you have all these things, on, and, and, and you're probably not building your own bootloader. I mean, but maybe you're in the special level of madness where you're also maintaining your own bootloader packages. And so you actually have all that sorted out. You're still maintaining the integration point between the two. You have to teach the thing how to like talk to it and configure it and let it know that you have a new kernel image. And then of course, you probably want to be able to deliver it and maintain it and version it and track it. And while the kernel build actually includes a way to build packages, those packages probably don't work because no one uses them. And so you have to either fix them, which some people do sometimes, or you have to make your own packaging of some kind to do it. And if you're not using a popular packaging system like RPM or Deb or Snap Gears, I guess, if you mm -hmm. do it that way too, because that's also a mode it supports, then you have to come up with a whole way to do it yourself for your own thing. So that's the, that's just only if you're doing it for yourself. We haven't even gotten into how to do it at scale for lots of people. It's just for yourself. So when we talk about the Linux kernel for distributions, we go through a lot of the same challenges and have a lot of the same problems to solve and a lot of this to work. But everything now gets worse because it's now at scale. It is now tracking the, the options for features and changes and churn. We're now tracking it for multiple architectures. Unless you were already a poor sap doing this for multiple architectures for some reason for yourself. Um, you're usually not doing that. You're probably just building it for your computer and your computer is x86. Or, you know, if you live in the, in the crazy world of ARM SPCs, you're probably just building one for ARM and not really worrying about x86. Well, distributions have to worry about everything. So you got your x86 computer here, then you've got your weird SPC over here that's ARM. And oh, what's this? This little thing that's got like a five, a Roman numeral five on it that you have to, that mm -hmm. like whenever, whichever one you look at it funny, and then it's completely different again. You got all those other ones that you have to think about. And each of these have different modes and features and changes and behaviors. And you also want to be able to say, when I do this build on today and tomorrow, the inputs and the outputs are going to make sense every time. And that is also a challenge in its own right because, again, we just talked about how the, the kernel build process is special and the variables are all actually make macros and all this other fun stuff. And this gets to be very weird and complicated. And then at the end, we also need to integrate this into the larger machinery of a distribution process. Whether you're an RPM-based distribution, Debian distribution, or your use is something special like Moss from the Serpent Guys, or, uh, or Stone, sorry, they call it Stone, and, uh, and Stone and Boulder, and, and uh, EO package from Solus, or, uh, or, or the Yocto Pokey system and all these other things. Like you got to figure out your way you're going to plug all this stuff in. And then you have to figure out how the kernel life cycle and development process matches to your distribution. Well, how are you going to, because it definitely doesn't, so how are you going to resolve that conflict? Are you a long-term distribution? Does that mean that you're, is your long-term distribution going to say, okay, I need to stay on a particular kernel version, which means I need to handle figuring out how to bring hardware enablement or features or fixes or whatever to the kernel that I decided to ship 
And my choices are never, this is awesome, this is, this is bad and less bad and okay and maybe okay. Because you don't really know where you're going to be in this treadmill. And then you always are going to have to reconcile this based on your own expectations and your users' expectations. So these are, these are the things that distributions have to think about uh, in some form or fashion. And in, in my previous talk where we talked about uh, CentOS Stream and CentOS Hyperscale, you know, we kind of highlighted this. And this is going a little bit more in depth into those kinds of concerns. So building for Red Hat distributions is probably pro the one that I'm the most experienced with because I do it a lot. Um, so Red Hat, several years ago, um, evolved their kernel build process into providing this, uh, doing something around this project called the Continuous Kernel Integration Project, or CKI. And CKI's primary deliverable, its output, is something called the Always Ready Kernel, or ARC for short. This refers to the fact that the tree contains an always ready release of the uh, release tree to create the Red Hat Enterprise Linux kernel. So you can take uh, you can take a commit from the tree if it's been built and it successfully has made packages, then that means it is both built a Fedora kernel base as well as a CentOS slash RHEL kernel base. And they can use this to be able to say at any point in time, alongside, for example, Fedora ELN, to create a fully usable and bootable system that represents a Red Hat Enterprise Linux-ish system. And the goal here is to make it so that they can be much more responsive towards adapting things and accepting things and supporting new things um, and being able to track things like that. Remember that kconfig churn I mentioned earlier? Like how if, if when you move to new versions of the kernel, everything can change, you won't know. Well, now those things are kind of tracked pairwise. Whenever a new kernel version is imported into the tree or a new commit comes in and they notice that the configs have changed, it'll start adapting it for you. And you can kind of see those links of commits and that information is all captured in a way that that allows them to be responsive. The important thing though about this is that it has it is all done by just integrating a Red Hat folder into the tree of a, of a vanilla kernel tree that contains scripts and related files, including a specialized way to maintain the distribution kernel build configuration. And this build configuration is designed in such a manner that you have each config option is separated into its own file, which makes it very easy to track in Git because Git works by tracking sets of files and as they change and transition and move and whatever. And that makes, you know, handling the evolution of the kernel tree and tracking where things happen much easier. So the one of the things that I work on here that uses this ARC infrastructure is the Fedora Asahi Remix. This brings Fedora Linux to Apple Silicon platforms. For all intents and purposes of this conversation, we're, re we're really only going to talk about the kernel part. There's a lot of other pieces related to that. Go see our other talks about this. Davida and I did a talk at Linux Fest Northwest last year about it. That'll probably be fun. Go check it out. But uh, for, for the kernel side of this, we have a large patch set from the Asahi Linux project on top of a major kernel version. So for example, 6.6. Currently, we're at 6.8. Um, and then we have configuration changes, like again, custom config settings that have been added as a consequence of these patches that need to be turned on. And then turning on and changing the way that we build the kernel for ARM so that we have a flavor that is built with 16K pages. Because most distributions by default use 4K pages. And, and this is from the memory management part of the Linux kernel which defines like essentially the window in which memory is allocated and, and, and used in, in the memory manager system. I'm trying to be very simple here. This is a very complicated topic. Um, but the important bit here is that the Linux kernel does not let you change this dynamically at runtime per application or per, per process. Um, this is something that Mac OS can do. Linux cannot. It has to be set once at build time and it affects everything. And if you don't use 16K pages, Goodbye USB, PCI, Thunderbolt, and everything else, because all of that requires talking with 16K pages. 
So you have to use 16K pages, even though the CPU supports 4K as well. So we use 16K. The ARC model helps here by allowing us to maintain this in a way where we can very consciously and easily track the delta, and we're able to have we're able to avoid a split brain effect where you can have the configs in one place and the code changing in the other. And we, and when the code changes, we can have the config change at the same time. And so we avoid problems where things break because things haven't been reconciled as, as the code has changed. This is really important because when you have over a thousand patches on top of the Linux kernel that are not mainline, you are going to be in for a world of pain if you can't make sure everything is changing correctly at the right times. Like the most recent rebase that I did, like one of the earlier test kernels, I accidentally missed a patch and HDMI audio stopped working. Yay. Uh, easily fixed, moved on, nobody ever saw that, it's fine. But those are the kinds of things that can happen when you don't really know and you can't really observe uh, those things and, and make sure that they're coming together when you're, when you're integrating it. If you're having a much more developer-centric view of this, being able to work on the source code and the packaging in the one repo means that you can avoid this split brain and you make sure that your code is being turned on the same time you're adding it. So that's, that's really the, the benefit there. But as I, as I mentioned earlier, you know this is a thousand patches on top. And because the, there's no stability, we have to do all this rebasing all the time. And so while we have a lot of upside with this model when we're talking about this developer-centric stuff and being able to integrate these patches, the big downside is it takes a long, long time to get everything good to go. We actually missed 6.7 because of this. We did not release a kernel 6.7 for the Fedora Asahi remix because it took so long to get all the patches rebased, to get everything integrated and get everything on top of that we didn't actually finish it. We did not finish getting 6.7 done, and so we just didn't. 6.8 released like, I don't know, uh, uh, week three into doing the integration work, and so it's just like, well, there's no point now. This is, I, I want, I'm, I'm using this example to underscore something. If you're thinking it's okay, to have a huge pile of patches on top of the Linux kernel and say you're gonna be able to maintain that kernel, I'm telling you right now you're not gonna be able to. <laughs> this is not gonna happen and you're going to be in for a super bad time because this patch set keeps, uh, I mean, and we're even trying to get all these things upstreamed, right? We do a lot of work to build the, to make this code changes in a way that's acceptable for the kernel community. We go through the process to try to submit them for review, but the Asahi team is basically touching almost every subsystem. It takes a lot of time. And the patches keep piling up because we're doing all this integration work and the reviews are not happening fast enough. If you're a kernel developer and you're listening to this and you care at all about making the Linux kernel work in more places, please review our patches when we send them because I would like the patch load to go down. I have been very sad as the patch load has gone up every release. Uh, for the past year. I would like it to go down just a little bit. Um, so yes, this is a challenge. And, and again, we do, we do handle it. We are releasing kernels relatively timely. We are keeping up to some degree. But it does, it, it carries significant risk. And actually, we see extreme versions of this with things like the Raspberry Pi, which is the most popular ARM SBC on the planet. And yet, there is no distribution today that can ship Raspberry Pi 5 support because most of the enablement never was submitted to upstream. So every distribution that wants to support the Raspberry Pi 5 has to do this. They have to go through the process of finding the patches that the Raspberry Pi Foundation had contracted to get made for their kernel. They have to pull them out. They have to clean them up. They have to rebase them on top of whatever kernel they want to ship. And they have to go through this whole thing to get it going. And it is a lot of work. And in most cases, what winds up happening, if a distribution does this at all, they're probably going to have a kernel RPI or something like that flavor. And that flavor never gets updated because they can't really keep doing this. It is really, really freaking hard. Uh, 
And that's the Raspberry Pi, which is the best case scenario because someone is going to be like, I want this to work with everything. And they will try to figure out how to get it working mainline. And eventually you'll have some basic support working without the custom patches. But it takes months, years. Uh, and that's the Raspberry Pi. That's the best case. Most of the ARM SPCs, a lot of the RISC-V stuff, everything else is worse. Everything else is so much worse. Because a lot of times they don't really do maintenance and they don't really care about the long-term value of supporting these things. And because they're probably not doing stuff like this, so they don't observe the pain. But that's, again, that's just the Fedora Sahi remix. CentOS Hyperscale is a different story. So CentOS Hyperscale, we used to use a RHEL kernel, and that was derived from a kernel version with fixes and backported. This became really difficult to do, largely because we, we were trying to enable new features. We were backporting lots of new user space stuff. You know, when David and I were talking earlier about this, we were talking about bringing new systemd, bringing new virtualization. And that means new features that are brought in the kernel, because these things are things that require backports to the kernel space to enable them. Or what if we want to have, you know, the new fancy Nouveau that actually, like, makes it so the driver doesn't suck with recent NVIDIA GPUs. So you don't have to use the proprietary driver anymore. Well, we would want that too. Well, it turns out, if you're working on a really old kernel, oh, this is so hard to actually do, because you're taking whole subsystems back and you have to reintegrate them again, and you have to adjust and twiddle every little change. But you want to, if you want to do it in a way where you preserve the attribution and the original provenance in the, in the commits, you have to be very, very careful. And it's a lot of work. I do not envy anybody at Red Hat who works on the rel kernel because they do this every bloody day, and it is really, really hard. Um, it is probably the thing that I would say makes it the most worth it to pay for Red Hat Enterprise Linux because they work their butts off to make that thing work in a way where you don't know that it takes hundreds of people to make a release to go out the door for that kernel. But I'm not hundreds of people, so I'm not doing that. Uh, <laughs> so instead, what I decided to do was go back to Arc at the very beginning, like what Fedora does, and then just take that back and then apply the configs to enable the features we have. In contrast to the Fedora Sahi Remix uh, scenario, with this scenario, all I'm doing is applying, turning on features that are already in the mainline kernel. I don't have any significant non-upstream functionality. Uh, hopefully that isn't a situation that ever changes because I, I very much like my sanity. Um, but with no significant patches and no non-merged things, moving to new releases happens very quickly. It's basically whenever I can get a free moment, done. It takes like 45 minutes to two hours and I'm done. It takes a bunch of time because I'm not a crazy person. I want to actually make a build locally and then run it to make sure that it works. And then I will submit it and then it will get built and released and signed and all the fanciness. But yeah, and it's, it's not that hard when all you're really doing is managing config things. It's really when you have to deal with these large patch loads that things get complicated. But you still have all the same problems from before. We're talking about like when you're updating the kernels, you gotta check all these configs, you gotta make sure that they're actually doing something. They have to actually apply. They have to actually do something and run. And it is actually sometimes very difficult to determine whether it does something or not because KBuild doesn't tell you anything. So what about other distributions? We focused on the Red Hat family because that's what I mostly work on. But I do work on a bunch of other distributions and I have worked with their other infrastructure types. So SUSE distributions are interesting. So SUSE distributions use a repository that they call kernel source, which is not actually the source code, mm -hmm. but in fact, a bunch of scripts and templates for generating the packaging around the source, and it exports, it'll download a Linus's tree, and then turn it around and apply all the things, and then export it out as another Git repo. This is called the kernel tree in, in the OpenSUSE land, and they have this automatically submitted to their build service. They also have like a, an inspector service thing that you can look at. They have a kernel tree browser that allows them to see like all the features and flags and whatever. That's how that's done for SUSE distributions. Debian uses a packaging repository that contains a make file that uh, 
runs inside of itself to construct the build flags and options and all these things based on what it detects in the build environment through the Debian vendor, the target architecture, and the image variants. To build a package, the sources have to be downloaded and merged with the packaging files separately. And then it goes through and rolls through itself a few times to generate its final Debian packaging files, runs itself again, then revalidates itself, and then eventually builds the final package. So you could kind of consider the self-modifying code, except it's self-modifying make files and Perl scripts. Oh, right, I forgot to mention, uh, Debian is like Perl and make, you know, fused into an ugly, unholy uh, mess. And that's how, that's how that packaging model works. Um, with some mangled source trees for added fun. Um, Ubuntu uses a variant of the Debian style, except they pre-merge all the sources because they have Ubuntu sauce. Um, so, which is what they term for special patches that they make that they, are, they do not intend to send upstream or anywhere else. It is part of their kernel tree that they do on their own. And this can include things like, I don't know, let's bring back AUFS, even though it's been dead for 10 years. But we're just going to keep shipping it because, because Ryzen's. Uh, and, you know, let's, you know, let's jam in ZFS into the source tree. Or let's, you know, we've got, we, we have this app armor super patch that devolves it and, and essentially replaces lots of the code. Or we have some features and fixes and backports or modifications, like some regular stuff. But there's, there's a lot of, like, fun in, the, uh, uh, in there. And that's why they maintain a merge tree rather than the split tree that Debian does. Um, each Ubuntu version has their own kernel repo based on the code name. So, for example, Ubuntu 2404 is noble. And the other ones are like, you know, like 2110 was kinetic and things like that. Arch, Magia, and Open Mandriva all have much simpler things. All they do is make the config file. It's one big config file, as you saw earlier. And they just ship it as a source. They run it. And they hope it works. Um, and that's pretty much it. The, this is the closest to how an individual build it, and they do it that way because quite likely it's just an individual building it. And so they don't really, and in some of these, like for example, Arch, they only care about x86, so their lives are super easy compared to everyone else. Do they have ARM? Um... No, not yet. But they, so uh, Michelle right. in the audience has said that they have ARM. Arch, Arch ARM is not an official project. And that is essentially another one-man show doing his own thing. And that guy also only cares about ARM, so his life is super easy, too, compared to everyone else. Uh, but, you know, Magia and Open Mandriva. Open Mandriva has, like, uh, let's see, x86, ARM, AMD x86, and, uh, and RISC-V. So they've got four architectures that they do separately. Oh, yes, yeah, so they... Uh, Open Mandriva also is special in that they build the kernel and everything else with Clang. Uh, so that makes a whole new bout of funness because everyone else uses GCC. And so they get interesting quirkiness with that. But they also build the whole distribution for x86 twice. Once for generic and a second time for Ryzen platforms. So they have AMD Zen based optimizations on their, as a variant. It's a whole other thing. It's neat if you've got an AMD platform. Check it out. Um, Magia is more n normal. They just have a bunch of config files for each of the different architectures and they build it like five times. Um, and, and yeah. But I want to point out here, like the whole, the whole discussion is really about talking about that the Linux distributions, they build the kernel, they optimize their processes for building it for the long haul. They have to care about this over time because they can't afford to spend buttloads of effort every time, every day. So they're more willing to front load it with an architecture to, you know, a, a semi-complicated architecture up front in order to potentially minimize the effort that they need to do things down the road because they can't afford to have to spend a lot of time on these things in order for them to be able to be responsive when it matters. And a lot of these distributions, particularly Red Hat and SUSE, Fedora and Asahi, you know, they do a lot of upstream work. They're participating in the kernel development stuff. And that makes things worse, not better. 
they don't have as much time to deal with all this stuff. And that's why those distributions, they have very custom systems for managing the kernel packaging. Whereas ones that probably don't do this as much, they tend to have much simpler kernel packaging stuff because they have more time to deal with the packaging side because they're not dealing with the development too. But regardless of all that, you're going to see characteristics and the properties about dealing with this problem for the long haul because this is the common problem that all the distributions have to deal with. It's what I have to deal with. It's what you know, many of the other folks that work on this have to deal with. And yeah, there you go. Time for questions? Yeah, you have about 15 minutes. Wow. Oh. I thought I was going slow enough. <laughs> <laughs> Question about asking for Asahi uh, code reviews. Yeah. You mentioned that, you know, you're asking like, um, hey, if you, have, if you are a kernel developer, like, can you have with you? Uh, but kernel development uh, kind of work in a tree-based thing, I guess. So <coughs> you might be recognized as an expert in one subdomain, but not necessarily in another. Do you find that kernel developers are helping you? Like, a, like a, if they are an expert in file system and they <coughs> do something for like, a, I don't know, like Thunderbolt or something, are they willing to review? And because I, like, I, I don't want to stake my reputation on something, I don't actually know that. So I don't know if Michelle was captured in this. And I'm pretty sure he wasn't captured in this. So I'm going to summarize it because it was a long question. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Are, are we seeing reviews from people? And because the Linux kernel has this special uh, military style hierarchy model for maintainers um, that where people work in particular subsystems but not necessarily others, do we see people willing to go out of their way to review things that they may not necessarily be fully familiar with? Um, the answer to this is uh, at least from what I've observed. And again, I don't see the complete picture because not everybody remembers to CC all the Asahi maintainers whenever they're trying to send the patches for Asahi enablement stuff. Um, no, they, they don't typically want to step outside of their playgrounds um, very much. And that actually makes things a little difficult because um, some subsystems have people, have a lot of people, and some have very few. Sometimes it's a, down to two or one, and sometimes that's even a lie, and the, the number is actually zero. Uh, that, is the, that was the case, for example, with Wi-Fi. Where we, so we've carried a large patch set that essentially massively reworks the Broadcom Wi-Fi driver to actually work. Uh, and that patch set has lived out of tree for almost two years. And it is very difficult getting reviews for that because the people that maintain the Broadcom Wi-Fi driver upstream, well, they don't have time to review anything. So they, those patches just sit there. Uh, and, and this is true for a lot of subsystems. Um, it is very rare that you have a singular set of developers that go and touch almost uh, several subsystems in the Linux kernel. And so you get a much different perspective of Linux kernel maintenance when you have to look at the kernel holistically. When you look at the kernel holistically, uh, it, is, it is very, it is, it is super varied and it, it balances out. Again, there's lots of people working on it, but like it's a very uneven landscape. So like you see more people, for example, working on graphics and you see more people working on networking well, yes, on, on wired networking. Then you do see wireless networking or power management. <laughs> yes, power management is a big, sad state of affairs right there. But um, we do see people reviewing sometimes. There are some people that will come out of their way to do it. But one of the other problems specifically with Linux kernel reviews is that um, because there is no actual formal process and everybody yeah. treats reviews differently, you don't know if you are not part of that part of that team whether your review will be ignored or not. So, for example, I actually go like for ButterFS. For example, I was asked by one of the ButterFS developers some time ago that if I would consider stepping up testing and reviewing things. Well, so I started doing that, and then one of the other ButterFS people said that uh, they're not sure what to do with my reviews, so they've been ignoring them. 
which is a whole other special ball of crazy because because there's a, because reviews are just replies to emails right. with the statement of saying I reviewed this yeah. and each maintainer has a different expectation of what reviewed means and no one writes down what that is yeah. and so it, it becomes a very very patchy road to figure out what you where, where this is going to pardon the pun um, so the the short version of this answer is kind of but not really um, because uh, sometimes kernel developers are just kind of afraid to go out of their playgrounds and also because it, a lot of the effectiveness of reviews is based on reputation right. yes so part part of what you've said to me or said said in this room and, and specifically to Michelle's question kind of scares me a little bit because mm -hmm. I have a lot of I mean, I want this to be something that I can share with other kernel, other kernel driver maintainers who are resistant to upstream. Right. Right. So, what what do you think are the things that you can do, or that they can do, that we can do, mm -hmm. um, to uh, to quicken this pace or to uh, participate in things like Arc? So. A big way to do this is meet the kernel developers in person somehow. Okay. So like, I, I know this, this is a very low tech answer, but it's also the only one that I know absolutely works. Um, if you go to, for example, the Linux Plumbers Conference, or you go to the relevant subsystems uh, conference like KVM Forum for the virtualization people, um, LSF MMBPF for the apparently the file systems, Memory management and the BPF people, yeah, like yes. only one. <laughs> yeah, um, or or for example, the um, SIG graph is one I think that the that the display people often go to. The graphics people go to SIG graph and they hold their own little powwow in there. I don't know if they have a, a separate conference in their own right, but Linux plumbers is probably like if you've got a bunch of like just random driver people. Um, Linux Plumbers is a good place, but also like another way to do this if you can't really travel is to just start showing up and, and send patches of your own things and also maybe do reviews of other patches to kind of show and, and, and be willing to give critical feedback. So most of these people, um, again, I just said it's about reputation and that means that showing, showing your skill, both reading and writing, tends to help a lot. Reading being reviewing, writing being sending sending patches. Doing both at the same time tends to help a lot and it can speed things up a lot. Um, and don't be rude. That, that also helps. Yes. You, you think I don't have to say this, but I, I have to say this. Not, just being nice to people goes a long way. Yeah. I've, I've also found that helping them set up their environments to, to work with the mailing lists. That helps a lot too. Yeah, another aspect of this is the mailing list thing. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's it's special and also is the only project that's really like this these days. Used before. Yeah. Uh, yep. Um, so, like all of our slabs have different builds and stuff. Yep. So I've noticed that there's not very many updates lots of times, but now they're getting slightly better. That more and more brands of phones have more updates. I believe that might have something to do with Yocto. Nope. No. <laughs> so for an, uh, if if Yocto was the silver bullet for fixing this, I think this would have been fixed a long time ago. <laughs> uh, so what's actually happening for I, I assume you're talking about the slabs of glass being the Android devices. Yeah. So what happened is about I want to say seven years ago, Google started this project called Project Treble, and the idea was that they would decouple kernel, hardware integration user space, and Android user space into separate parts that can be updated separately. And so uh, what's actually happening for a lot of devices is that Android user space is getting updated without everything else being updated anymore. Yeah. So you don't get kernel updates still, uh, but you get everything else. Which is better than no update. It's better than no update, but doesn't fix the problem at all. The, the, the actual problem is more um, socioeconomical. The issue is that companies who make Android devices don't really have a particular drive from either consumers or 
or industry or regulation to care about their software. And because they don't have to do that, they don't push that to their suppliers and to their vendors. And so it leads to this cacophony of, well, I've got to have this board support package, which is a technical term in the industry referring to a collection of drivers and, and patches to integrate a, a particular piece of hardware to run on the Linux environment. Take this board support package, plop it on top, and then you know, you know, mash it up a bit, and then you have a new kernel that maybe works for the hardware. But that's it. And, and a lot of times, after that board support package has been produced, they don't do anything ever again for that particular piece of hardware. There are some exceptions. Rock Chips does a good job of doing this in a way that they support the, their stuff upstream. Qualcomm is starting to kind of get into this, which is crossing my fingers that it's going to be good. Um, Ventana on the RISC-V side, they've been cautiously good is the way I'm going to describe it. Uh, or I, I am cautiously optimistic about how they're doing things. They're doing okay so far. We'll see how it goes. Um, and there's a few others out there that are that are kind of doing stuff, but the vast majority of people, MediaTek or, or low-end Qualcomm or um, Exynos, you're kind of screwed. Um, Pixel phones are notable for being one of the few devices where Google, where it is required that that device boots off of the mainline kernel. So Pixel devices typically do get kernel updates because their board support packages are contributed to the mainline Linux kernel, uh, or at least the Android generic kernel, which, uh, which is, a, again, a whole other separate set of things that we're not going to talk about because that would be another 20 minutes. Um, but yeah. Basically, what's happened is, for the most part, you're not getting kernel updates. You're just getting everything else. Any other questions? OK. Thanks. <laughs>